this morning in Galatians chapter number 5. We're going to continue our studying here in the issue of you, the real you, your makeup and everything. And uh, we've spent rather, I think this is like lesson number 7 in all of this. And we've just, um, we're going to do today and next week and then we're going to move a little bit into some other areas And uh, when we do that, uh, again, just to understand how God has designed and created you to function and to operate, and no matter what life brings to you, no matter what comes your way and uh, so forth in life, you need to understand how to think about it, how 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 to have the right perspective about it and about the events. And then understand that God has given you an answer in His Word to every event that comes up in life that you're going to struggle with. Um, I've often said you know it, and hopefully you know it to be true, that every prayer you've ever prayed or think about or talk to God about, the answer is in the Word of God. It's A lot of times it's not what we want, you know, but it's there. And we then have to take the Word and understand it and trust it and uh, see what uh, it has to say for us and to us and everything. And today we're going to talk about the issue that in, within you, in, there is a conflict that is in you. And uh, again, we've been dealing with the issue, and one more time we'll put this guy up here. We, we've been dealing with the issue of the Spirit, okay? And we, we looked at the issue of the mind, and, and, we, and we took the Spirit and we broke it down and we saw where it's your mind, it's a communication center that you have between, between God, and, and I'm going to have to put this out here, between God's Word, okay, and or human viewpoint, all right? And, and I'm going somewhere with this this morning, so we're trying to break it up a little bit, but this is your mind, that, that, the, this is your memory center, your vocabulary center, because even when you have human viewpoint, you have vocabulary, See Pat run. See Pat, you know, remember how you learned to read, okay? So you have vocabulary, you have memory. So these are really, they go both ways. It's just how you're created. You have to understand when God made man, it, they were not, there was, sin wasn't in the equation at the moment. So he makes man this way. Humanity is made this way. This is where you're going to build in your norms and your standards. Now your norms and standards First, they come from mom and dad, <laughs> okay? They're building in how, you know, moms and dads, our job is to raise productive, uh, is, is to raise productive citizens and kids, okay? And, and not monsters, but productive citizenry. But so you have your norms and standards built into here. Then your soul, and these are the two components that make up your inner man, your soul we, we looked at, and that's the issue of your heart, and the heart is the mentality of your soul. So your heart and your, your, your spirit and your soul connect right here with the mind. But a component of your heart is your will and the ability of, to make a decision and to make a choice and to believe something and or not to believe something. And then also you have the issue of your conscience, and then you have the issue of your emotions, and your soul and, and, and your conscience are the evaluators, and your emotions are the responders, and they are responding to your heart and, and to your will and to your volition and what you've chosen to do. And, and really, these three components are the main components of your soul. These are the three areas where everything's going to come out of. And then last time, last week, we looked at the issue of your body. And I tried to say in the issue of your body is that Paul uses terminology that you have to be very careful with. Because he's, by the way, your body, it's the vehicle that totes the soul and the spirit around. Your body is how you understood today that it was raining. Because when you walked out in it, what happened? You got wet. You get wet and your body says, I'm wet. What's going on here? Then your mind says, well, dummy, get, out, get in out of the rain, okay? Or in some of your cases, let's go play in the rain because we don't see it enough, right? 
So, and by the way, when your body, this vehicle, when it hurts, you have systems, don't you? And you have senses. You have resources that come into your body, this physical thing here. You're wonderfully and fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm says. And we looked at that issue about where Paul talks about that issue of your body being the vehicle. But he also calls that body flesh, doesn't he? And the issue of the flesh. But there's a physical issue called the flesh, and then there's the spiritual issue called the flesh. And we were looking at that last time. We're going to, that's where we kind of bring up today a little bit with about the conflict. But your body also has emotions. And where your body connects with your inner man is right there in the emotions. And that's where the connection happens. In, in your body, you can have good emotions. And you can have bad emotions. You can have a happy, good emotions, happy, alive, love, interested, positive, strong. Or you can have negative emotions, can't you? Anger, depressed, confusion, helplessness, indifferent, afraid, hurt, sad, insecurity, guilt, doubt. All those are emotions that are set in, in really in both of those emotional makeups. And they're there. And, and, and today, Galatians 5, if you will, I just there's a conflict that's rolling here. And the conflict, by the way, if you're on the right pattern, the body, if you're in the right flow, the body's design is to work good works. And how you're going to work good works out in your life is by having the proper flow from God's Word. As you build it up into your inner man, as you build it up into your norms and standards, when Paul says, I've laid the foundation, the foundation is Jesus Christ, and you need to remember how you do what? Build on it, right? What are you building on that foundation? Good, silver, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Remember those things? Okay, that's norms and standards. That's inside here. That's in your body. 2 Corinthians 5 says you're going to you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and the things done in your body, whether they be good or bad. That's right here. What are you building in here? Are you building in gold, silver, and precious stones? Or are you building in the human viewpoint, the logic, okay, of human viewpoint? The heart looks down, says this is what we're going to do. The conscience, they make a decision. The will tells the emotions. You go tell the body, it's time to go to work, and let's get going. The conscience looks up and says, yep, that's matching what the will has decided, and that's matching what the norms and standards tells us to do. Okay? Now, there's a conflict in this. Last week, when we were looking through Romans 6, I told you that, well, look at Galatians 5.16. Let's just do it here. Galatians 5.16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a conflict, and it's going to impact all of this. It impacts you in a greater manner than ever before. You have a decision to make. By the way, Rome, verse 16 is a nutshell verse that, capsulize, that, that encapsulizes Romans chapter 6, is verse 16. If you want Romans 7, let's read verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the, and, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That's a capsule of Romans 7. Verse 18, but if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. There's the capsule of Romans 8 being led of the Spirit, verse 14. So when you get into this issue about the conflict here, and, and, and when you make the choice to walk in the way that you were designed to walk, to let the Word of God build in the, the to be the standard which you live by, okay, then you're going to walk in the Spirit. 
and when you let the truth of God's Word be what fills your mind up, then you're going to be in verse 16, this I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not, what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's very clear to me. Maybe not to you, but it is to me. It's like the verses in Romans 6. Hold here and just look back there. I don't know. Romans 6. Our identity, the position that we have in Christ. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's very clear to me. There's no ambiguity there. There's no explanation needed there. What is, what is your status? You're dead to sin, aren't you? That, there's nothing there. There's no more. He goes on in verse 8, 9, and 10 to give you the illustration of who we are of Christ because that's where we get that identity. Verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be indeed, dead indeed unto sin, but alive... Pretty clear to me. Go back to Galatians 5. Verse 16 is clear. If you're going to do what? If you're going to walk in the Spirit, you're going to make the choice of your heart and of your will to allow the Word of God to be what directs your way, what are you going to do? You're not going to do what? Fulfill the lust of this flesh, are you? Now let's pray so we can go to eat. I give you back all the overtime I've taken from you. I got an email from a guy this past week. said, how dare you keep those people an hour and a half last Sunday? It wasn't an hour and a half. He can't read his time, but he chewed me out. And I said, well, obviously you didn't listen. He goes, no, I got done after the first five minutes. You're such a boom and blew up. So I don't pray. <laughs> pray for him, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. See, the thing is, is, Look, folks, this stuff is clear. The verses say what the verses say. What, is that, what does verse 16 say? If you walk, I, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If I make the choice in myself, my mind, my, who I am, to do what? To take in the Word of God, by the way, rightly divided, stay out of the law program. By the way, that's what Romans 6.14 tells you then I'm going to build into me in the norms and standards of God's Word. Then I will be able to do what? Not fulfill this guy. Because that guy, that flesh... And by the way, we're talking a spiritual issue here in 5.16, okay? We're not talking about the physical flapper here, okay? Because verse 17 tells you something that's happening to you. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are, what? Contrary. Woo! That's not good, is it? So, you, so that old sin nature, the old flesh, that, that connection that we have to Adam, it raises its head up. And it begins to revolt against what you're doing by filling your mind with the Word of God, rightly divided. And, it, and, and what begins to happen in you is you have a sinful, emotional response to you walking in the Spirit. And I say it that way because I know you because I know me. Because that guy right there, the flesh, operates in the emotional realm. Your emotions are stupid. They're dumb. They're responders. So when the flesh says, I don't want to you to do, I don't want to do the good works. That's the goal, right? They don't make me feel good. Have you heard that? Maybe you've said it. That is a sinful emotional response to you walking in the spirit. It's satanically inspired, by the way. We don't get into all that. Notice what's happening here. There's a conflict. There's a lust against the spirit, and there's a lot, I mean, they're, they're going at it. Hold on to Galatians 5, come to Romans 7. I told you 7, 17 was a capsule verse of Romans 7. By the way, the Galatians were struggling with this. And the reason that they were struggling, Romans 7, 
with this is because they had forgotten. They, had, they were mixing the law with grace. And the law says you have to perform, and if you don't perform, then you're doing something wrong. God's grace says, no performance necessary. I have done it all, and because you believed in me, it's all done. Right? Galatians, they're in Romans 6.14 territory. I know I told you 7, but read 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. They, They were allowing sin to dominate them, because they weren't back underneath the law, see? And Paul says, no, you, no. <laughs> All right, but there's a war, the conflict. Look at Romans 7 in verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of, ooh, to the law of what? Which is where? Do you see there's a, there's a battle, there's a war going on in your what? In your mind. And the guy that's opposite, opposing that is this guy. That old sin nature. You see that? It's clear. Verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. What a question. Who can deliver me from this war? Now, by the way, we're in Romans 7, we're in Galatians 5. He's talking to save people. So at no time in your life did God remove the old sin nature from this. Rather, he left it there. He had to because you needed to be able to connect to the system, to the world around you. You got work to do. But he didn't leave you hanging with no way to combat it. He gave you His Spirit. He gave you His Word. So what can you do? You can make a choice or the decision of your inner man to put in the Word of God that will then produce this over here, but this guy isn't going to like it. He isn't going to like it at all. Come back to Galatians 5. The flesh, our connection to Adam, and all of his resources and desires, the, 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 the air that was, was, was there in him. All of those resources, all of those desires, you know, you know what they want to have? They want to have their say. Here you are studying the Word of God. You're, you're, you know, you're in it, you're reading it, you, you, you're trying to figure some things out. You're rejoicing in the things that you know. And that old body, that old sin nature says, hey, wait a minute, what about me? You've been ignoring me. I I need to have a say in this. And the say is going to be in the emotional realm. They want to run things. And all the feelings and all the emotions that that old flesh can, can drum up to beat you up with, Have you ever felt inadequate? I have. This list is my list, by the way. But are you inadequate in who you are in Christ? But boy, sometimes you sure feel it, don't you? Folks, that's this guy beating the tar out of this guy. Shame, guilt, doubt. Insecurity, worry. Are you insecure in Christ? But boy, sometimes you sure feel it, don't you? You Your feelings, your emotions of that old sin nature are doing what? Beating the tar out of this guy. Fear, anxiety, distress. Paul will will look here in a couple weeks. Paul will say, on every side we're perplexed. We're distressed. But not. Look look over there. 2 Corinthians. Oh, I gotta find it. Hang on. All right. Where'd it go? 
it was right, 2 Corinthians 4. It was right there on the left-hand page on the center column. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Have you ever wondered why he left you in an earthen vessel? Why he left this treasure in an earthen vessel? Do you know why? So that back up in, verse, in, in chapter 3, verse number 9, that your sufficiency would be of God and not of yourself. That's why. That's what he says, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Because, man, if he left it in Superman, what Superman? Oh, man, look at how great I am. No, it's how great he is. Verse 8, we're, in, we're troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not what? Do you, do you see those emotions there? That's this guy. You're perplexed. You're, you're, you're distressed. You're, you're in trouble. You're persecuted. You're cast down. But what is reality? What is reality of life? What is the reality of your life? That's not true, is it? Because who are you in Christ? You are not distressed. You are not in despair. You are not forsaken. You are not destroyed. What's the reality of life? It isn't this guy and all the emotional rain that he does. That's fake. That isn't real. What's real? Who is real? Jesus Christ is. So what do you do? If you're in those despondence, you come over here to the Word and you say, you know what, I know that's not real, and I need help. i got to get to the Word of God to do what? Build it in here to combat the bad emotions. You see, the conflict is raging there. And all these things are sinfully authored, and they're designed to attack you, and they're designed to cause in your life an emotional revolt in your life. Go back to Galatians 5. They attack your emotions in, in your soul and in your heart. Now, you think about, remember your emotions. What are they? They're responding, but what are these guys responding to? The decision of the heart, aren't they? And they're responding to that. And what these guys are doing, the old sin nature, is he's moving into here. He doesn't move to there. He moves here. Because I don't feel good. When I'm being perplexed, I don't feel good. Do you feel good? When you're full of guilt, do you feel good? Not usually. You feel pretty bad, don't you? I do. Folks, these are, this list is my list. You, got, you get your own list. <laughs> okay. Problem is, is I think some of my list is your list. Because this is our connection to Adam. And what's he do? What's this guy doing? He doesn't run up here to the heart, because you know what the heart would do? Said, shut up. You're dumb. You're ignorant. You don't know what the decision was making. We were over here functioning on here. He doesn't go there. He goes right here to these guys. You know why? Because joy and joy are joy, aren't they? Hey, Alabama wins a football game. I have a lot of joy. ASU got stomped, so I gotta have joy somewhere. Okay, they they did. It's okay. It's all right. They got they got beat. The thing is, and by the way, so did U of A. So good for the goose, good for the gander. Okay, but see, the thing is, is what, what I I rejoice in the football game, but then I come over here, and what do I do? I rejoice, don't I? See, so we're talking apples to apples. What does he then do? You know what? Dude, you're right, man. I don't feel good. I feel pretty lousy. I feel pretty rotten. I feel like garbage. Hey, Will, guess what? Hey, Hart, I think you guys got this wrong. And you know what I'm going to do now? Is I'm going to be in charge for a while. And the conscience is sitting there screaming, no, 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 no. I've lost. He wins the day. Then when he tells the heart, this is what you're going to think. We're going to do stuff that makes us feel good. 
Because we want to be loved and liked and have happiness and everybody be on everybody and everybody wins and da da and da 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 da. And he said, and so you know what he does? He goes, you know what? That's a great idea, man. Let's go find it. Oh, it's not here. Oh, but there it is. Ooh, found it. And what do we start doing? Sucking in that mess. Follow that. Boy, that guy, the flesh guy is a bad news guy. The emotional revolt. He's trying to take over. And he does it through your, the emotions of, of, of you, of your soul. And he tries to tell your heart how to think. And you know what? They're, by the way, folks, these guys are real. You feel it. I have. I know what it is to wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I've had enough of this garbage. And this guy that keeps emailing me this, just delete. I know what it's like. I've been, I, <laughs> what, you kids get on the bus, sit down, shut up. If you make one more, I'm going to toss you off the bus. I've been there. Tossed a couple of them off the bus at their stops, of course. But, okay. All right. Hey, crowding ain't, oh, uh, Walking ain't crowding, and you can walk. <laughs> no, I, I got to be legal. People listen, you know. Hey, folks, I've been there. I understand that. They're real to you. But they're not what? They're not real. Because what is the reality? The reality is who you are in Christ, isn't it? What's going to last forever? Christ does. That's the reality. But when you walk in the Spirit, verse 16, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at that. Man, when you're walking in the right flow, so when this guy says, you know what, that, that doesn't make me feel good. This guy, that guy, the conscience, the emotions, they look at this guy and say, shut up. Be quiet. You don't get a say in the party because we're having a good party over here. Good works. See that? Now, by the way, there's a war. It's, it's a conflict. They're contrary one to, an, to another, verse 17 there. But notice that what verse 16 doesn't say. It doesn't say that the lust of the flesh is not there. It actually says that it is there. See that? So you have a choice then in the battle, to which one are you going to allow, and this is you, run you, run the show, which one's it going to be? They lust against each other, verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Lusting there, that's a passion. Lust is a passion. You put in whatever, you know, I, I lust for Alabama football. That's a passion for Alabama football, see? I know everybody says lust, ooh, that's a bad thing. That's just because your mind goes in the gutter when you hear that stuff. Okay? But look at, there's a passion. The Spirit has a passion. And the Spirit's passion is to live through you the way that, you're supposed, that He's designed to live. The proper way. The passion of the Spirit is for the Word of God to come in and begin to be what directs and educates and impacts your walk out here to producing the good works. So then what would the flesh be? If the Spirit wants to walk the right way, then the passion of the Spirit is to come back and have control the wrong direction. Follow that? I, I, if, if you don't, think about it. <laughs> the flesh comes in and says, I want to have control, and it's me, 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 and I have to be in charge. The Spirit says, no, the Word of God is in charge. And our goal is to do good works, Ephesians 2.10, just in case you don't realize that. And the flesh says, no, we're going to go this way and produce our own works. Verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Led of the Spirit, going the right way, working the right flow. The Spirit will never lead you to be under the law. 
Verse 18 is that's very clear. So if what you're thinking puts you underneath a performance-based system, then you know what you're not thinking? Like the Spirit would have you to think. Because what, again, verse 18, if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So what's the Spirit going to do? Not lead you to the law. He's going to lead you to grace and peace and who you are in Christ. If, ha- if, if you operate based on how you feel, your performance makes you feel good, then you know what you're under? You're under the law. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself... I'm sorry. I got 210 in my mind. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Boy, that sure makes me feel good. Then you know what you did? You performed somewhere. You got to be careful with that. The attack is on. And the attack is this guy is wanting to run the show. We're not talking about the physical body. We're talking about the spiritual connection that you and I have to sinful Adam, to sin. We call it the old sin nature, the the old man. And what's he wanting to do? Run the show. And where he gets you isn't through thinking it through. Because what would if you if if he operated in your thinking process of thinking this stuff through, what would your mind say? That ain't right. The conscience would say, no, that's not right. So he doesn't go that way. Why? He knows better. Satan knows better. He goes which way? Emotions, because then with the emotions, what could we, well, you know what? I really like doing stuff that makes me feel good. And, and, and you know what? Eat, hanging out and doing that, man, that makes me feel really good. And I really want to feel good because I hate feeling bad. By the way, if, you, if you're feeling bad, next week we're going to talk about victory because there's victory in this. Now, I want you to notice something. Come over with me to 1 John chapter 2. Because I've said a couple times, this is sinful, this is sinful, it's satanically inspired. Okay, you remember I said that now a couple times? Watch 1 John 2, 15 and 16 here. 17, but we really need 16, so for time, and try to get you out of here in 10 minutes. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You see those three areas? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three areas, Hebrews says that the Lord was tempted in all points common to man. You know how the Lord was tempted? He was tempted in those three areas. And you know what He did? He had victory in those three areas. You go read Matthew 4, you go look at Luke 4, and you know where he's tempted? In those three areas right there. And what the Lord demonstrated is that you can have victory if you're, who, if you're operating in who you are in Christ. Over those three areas. Those are the three basic areas. The lust of the flesh. Does that sound like somebody? There's the body. The lust of the eyes. There's the soul. And the pride of life. There's the spirit. Do you, know where the, do you know where the course of this world came from? The guy named Lucifer? Satan? Notice how it, it's, but is of the world, the way that verse ended. The lust of the flesh, the, the, the lust of the eyes with the eye, you know, the old proverb, the eye is the gateway to the soul. Mm-hmm. Stare into her eyes, you know. And the pride of life, that's knowledge, that's knowing stuff. Come with me to Genesis 3. Watch it get introduced into humanity. In Genesis 3. This is how I know this stuff is is a part of you. (laughs) How I know you work this way, because I sure know how I worked. (laughs) And this is right there. Genesis 3 and verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was, what? Good for food. There's the lust of the flesh. You know what? Man, when I ate that prime rib last night with asparagus, boy, the asparagus was okay, but boy, that prime rib was good, good, good. Mm, mm, mm. I don't like the green stuff, but I got to eat it because I'm told I got to eat it. You know? 
But man, that it was what? what when, when Eve saw that fruit hanging there, you know what she said? That's going to fulfill the lust of my flesh. It's going to make me feel good. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. There's the, there's the lust of the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one, what? Wise. You know what? There's the pride of life, that issue of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and having that. And you know what she did? She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. So that you know what they said? Uh-oh, we better do something. So we have Operation Fig Leaf, as Dad calls it. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And you know what they created right there? They created religion. Religion, cover me up. Cover me up before God. What should they have done at the colon or the semicolon when they knew that they were naked? What should they have done? Hold on a minute. We messed up. We better go back to God's Word. And let's go get, let's go get help. But they didn't. You know what they said? This guy says, oh, don't worry about it. I got this wonderful thing called a fig tree and a fig leaf and the fig and the fig. And, whoa, you can cover up. By the way, the fig in the Bible in Israel's history is the tree of their religion. They created religion. Come back with me to 2 Corinthians 11, a verse we know well. The attack is on, and you know where the attack is? Notice, by the way, when Satan got Eve... And in the list in 1 John 2, it starts here, then goes here, and then goes here. Remember I showed you in James how Satan flows? How does he flow? One, two, three, the reverse order. How does God flow? 1 Thessalonians 5, one, two, three. Remember I showed you that? How does he get you? How does he beat you? How does he defeat you? Flow in the opposite way. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. How did he get her? He got her to looking on something that wasn't real. He got her looking away from who she was in Christ. How does he get you? Same way. It doesn't make me feel good to go to Sunday and sit for an hour. And listen to preaching. I'd rather have a half hour, 45 minutes of singing and 15 minutes of a ditty. A feel-good ditty. I understand them benches get hard. I've sat in them. But see, the thing is, is that it, well, it's a feeling. How did he get Eve? He started here. He didn't come over here. He starts here. See? Bad, bad flow is right. Wrong way flow. Now come to Colossians 2, because there's something wonderful in all of this that happens to us the moment that we get saved, and we trust Christ. Colossians 2, and we did a study a few little time ago called the Operation of God, and one of the operations of God, if you look here at Colossians 2, starting in verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Look at that. When you got saved, one of the aspects that happens to you by the working of the Holy Spirit in you is that there is a cutting you free from the flesh. Look at what the verse says. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein he also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Look at what he did to you. He literally reached over here at Calvary and severed the spiritual connection that your old sin nature has over here to this guy. 
in made with the circumcision made without hands, comma, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Again, Galatians 5.16 says they're still around, aren't they? But what is the reality in your life? The reality is that that stuff's been cut away. Does that mean this guy's going to shut up and go home? Not at all. If not, get worse. You follow that? The wonderful thing, folks, is, is God has equipped you and who you are in Christ to win the battle and to have victory at every turn. The flesh has been, it's been cut free from you. So you have, you now, you, this guy right here, you're now in charge. Now come back with me to Romans 6. All of this comes out of an understanding of Romans 6, 7 and 8, but 6. Romans 6, verse 14, we'll start there. See, folks, the wonderful thing about God and His dealings with you and I is, as He says, I've blessed you with all spiritual blessings. I've made you complete. I've given you all sufficiency. It's all here for you and me. What are you going to do with it? And He puts the accountability right back over on you. That's, what are you going to do with it? That's what these questions in 6 bring up. Should we continue and sin that grace may abound? Well, what kind of an idiot would say that? But just in case, God forbid. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under, sin, under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants are to whom ye obey. Whether of what? Sin unto death, there's this guy, or what? Obedience unto righteousness. There we are over here. Who are you going to serve? You got a decision to make. The choice lies with you. God says, I've provided everything for you. You have to decide where you're going to live. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. See, he took care of that. Ye, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. That's clear. What's your condition? What's your status? Free. You're the Lord's free man. Ye become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men, now watch, because of the infirmity of your flesh. See that? Paul knows, Paul's not out here in la-la land thinking of something that's off the cuff. That just he knows, he knows the struggle. By the way, you know why he knows the struggle? Romans 7's coming, isn't it? He knows the struggle. He, the Lord knows you struggle. The Lord knows we all struggle. Paul's saying, but the reality of it is what? What is the reality? The reality is, is you've been set free from sin to serve righteousness. I love, verse 19 is a great, verse 19 is a wonderful wow verse of, of just relaxing. Because I know to defeat the lust of the flesh, you know where I need to be? Over in the, Spirit and in the Word. Look at verse 19. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity and to iniquity. Boy, there's where you were. There's the battle. Even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death, but now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. Folks, if you let this guy win the day and rule the day, and there'll be days when he does, but what do you got to do? You got to put him back in his corner. All he's going to run into your life is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, you have a, you have a choice in this issue that's clear from Romans 6. Come over to Ephesians 4. On your way, stop in Ephesians 1, just for a verse. You have a choice. God says, I've given you everything. I provide it all for you. You need to decide where you're going to be. Well, I just can't do it. That's not what I just said. That's God talking. God says, I provided everything for you. You need to decide where you're going to be. Well, I just can't do No, I provided everything for I provided everything for you. It's like Moses with Israel. I present life and death. Please choose life. I've provided every, I've provided the mechanisms. I've done, you know, and what do we keep doing? Well, I can't do it. No, you can do it. Where? In Christ, who you are in Christ, in the Word, having this Word become the central. Not this guy. That's got to go away. Now, it doesn't completely go away. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you, you because this guy, 516 of Galatians, it's very clear that the battle's going to be there until we're called home. Romans 8. Ephesians 1, and just a couple verses real quick and we'll be done. Ephesians 1, look at verse one, number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Do you see the two groups there, the saints and the faithful? You see that? So obviously at Ephesus we've got, some, we got saints and then we've got the faithful, don't we? The ones who are there, and by the way, that's not faithful attendance. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but that's what? Hey, we're in the Word, we're studying the Word, we're, we're standing for the truth, we are contending for the truth, we're, we're, we're there, and when we are there, we're there. You know, okay, sometimes saints just drift in and drift out, and you don't see them ever again. And some, Okay, these guys, they're in. Now look in chapter 4, because some, something has come up in, 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 in this issue here. Chapter 4, and look at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Well, man, when he says that, what's going on? There's something serious here happening. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their what? Something's going on at Ephesus, which 1 Timothy 1 tells us they're going back under being teachers of the law and they're after fables and endless genealogy. But there's something over there, that issue, and Paul calls it the vanity of a Gentile mind. They're moving from God's Word back into human viewpoint. Actually, they're moving from God's Word, rightly divided, back under the law. They're still using God's Word. But he calls it the vanity, the emptiness of their mind. That ye henceforth walk... Not as other... I, this, Paul's not a happy man here trying to sing him a lullaby to put him to bed. He's scolding him in this book of doctrine, by the way. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened. Okay, the vanity of their mind. So they got bad information going into their mind. Now they're having their understanding what? Darkened. Now they're heart and their will is beginning to shut down because they're not, they don't have the proper information to go by to make a decision. By the way, when that happens, you're, in a, you're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto, well, there's the body and what, over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. So now we're not doing good works. Now we're working over here, and it's, and it's evil. We're working evil now. You see that? Now, by the way, the guy he's talking about in Ephesians 4 is a believer. He's a saint, or he could be one of the faithful. I believe he's one of the saints, not one of the faithful, because the faithful wouldn't get here. But guess what? You can get here. Now, what he just described here is he described a believer walking like an unbeliever. Because what's an unbeliever? Chapter 2, you're dead. You're dead. You're dark. You're depraved, aren't you? You see, when you, when you see here what's verse 19, verse 17, there's the spirit. Verse 18 is the soul. Verse 19 is the body. 
You're seeing a progression of not living as who you are in Christ. Trying to do something, trying to live in a reality of who you're not. And what has it done? It's caused trouble, hasn't it, in them. When you get the flow going the wrong way, you're going to give yourself over to this guy. And he's going to be in charge. Notice verse 19, who being past, what's that next word? Feeling. You're giving yourself over to something that, a feeling that is inaccurate, that's wrong. And they want to run the show. Now watch verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. Wow. Look at the fix. The fix is to remember who? Who you are in Christ. You have not so learned Christ. In the things that you've learned in Romans 6, 7, and 8, and in other passages, Ephesians 1. By the way, in Ephesians 1, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings. And he goes through that whole list of who you are in Christ, doesn't he? Romans 6 and 7 and 8, he gives you this whole list of you're dead to sin and your identity is in him. You're dead to the law and your game, the game is grace and that's what we're playing and you're alive to God. You get all of this stuff and Paul looks at you and goes, dude, you didn't learn any of that from who you are in Christ. You learned that by reversing the flow chart. Verse 22 well, verse 21, If so be that ye have heard Him, and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, I mean, and then he keeps going. We don't have the time to keep going. But look at what, what happens there. You got yourself so out of whack... You guys at Ephesus, some of you at Ephesus, and the only way to reverse the flow and to get it going back is to get your mind back where it should be. The war is on, the war is real, but what can you do in the war? You can win. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Come back with me to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. In verse 16, we talk about the renewed mind. That's where you and I need to be operating in, is the renewed mind. And when you think about sin, and you think about the bad feelings and all that stuff, you need to think about them in what? The renewed mind. You need to think about them in the reality of who you are in Christ, not in trying to diagnose this guy. He's already been diagnosed. God did it. He says his activity brings death. Then why do you keep trying to diagnose the guy? I have a diagnosis. I'm fat. Duh. How do I fix that? Well, you, now we got a plan, a remedy to fix that, right? I hope. <laughs> okay. I don't need to keep reminding myself that I'm what? Fat. Out of shape. Obese. Pleasantly plump. Okay. I don't... I need to what? I need to change my thinking. I, I understand that. I'm looking for a different result. Hey, this guy's in trouble. He's a troublemaker. So I need to put him in his place and keep him there. And how do I do that? I do that by renewing my mind and functioning in my renewed mind capacity. That's what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is all about, folks. It's talking about walking in with some maturity. Not always running over here going, eh, you know, no, moving on. Look, look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is what? Renewed. Renewed. Now finish that verse. Day by day. That's the key. In order to have victory, in order to stop sin in your life, in order to have a, a resident in your life of victory all the time, you know what you have to do? You have to, on a daily basis, renew your mind with the Word of God rightly divided. Coming to church once a week doesn't do it. It's got to be every day. Follow that? It's important to understand that Paul looks at Timothy and says, until I come, I give attendance to 
first thing in the list. Studying and getting in there. Reading. It's interesting. Then he gets into exhortation in the doc. But what? Reading. You take Romans, the Philemon, 13 little books, and you start reading them. You don't, don't rabbit trail, don't chase, don't try to diagnose, just read. And before long, you know what comes up? You'll be sitting there going, man, you know what? I really don't feel too good. Come over to 2 Timothy 1. You, you, you'll be sitting there going, man, I really don't feel, I really do, just don't want to be here. I really, I really don't. I don't like any of you. You're all just pain in the necks. You're, you know, you don't listen. You don't do what I teach you. You just, oh, I, I just really don't want, you know, you just get all balled up like that sometimes. And then you know what comes marching across my little pea brain? 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Isn't that interesting? But of what? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Isn't that interesting? You know, it doesn't matter whether I like you or not. Or how I feel about you. Well, Rick, you know, you just don't love me. Well, you better be careful. Because speaking the truth is in love is love. By the way, well, anyway, a little pun there, but that's okay. I've been told to remove the puns. The thing is, folks, is what do I have? I have a sound mind, a healthy mind. What did God give me? He didn't give me all that garbage over there. That's the, the, the lust of the flesh. What did He give me? He gave me the ability to have victory. Follow that? That's important. Because this war will wage until you give up the ghost. One more passage, I know. Get, get 1 Corinthians 15 and we'll, we'll be done. I, the verses are numerous and I only have 45 minutes with you, which is close to an hour now. 1 Corinthians 15. It, it, it's, it's just, folks, is there a conflict? Yes, there is. Is there a desire to do? And is there? Yes, there is. Only someone who doesn't study would say there's not. But what, have you, what do you have? You have the capacity in Christ, of who you are in Christ, to look at that and say, no, I'm not doing that. And then not do that. By the way, if this guy, think about that, he, a good emotion out of that guy, joy. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, what, joy? Now, think about that. If, if this guy sees this guy having joy all the time as a fruit of studying the Word of God, putting it in his inner man, making decisions on it, making this, getting over here to good works, you know, if he saw that all the time, do you think this guy would say, well, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't object. <laughs> maybe we should get on board. Maybe. Possible. Hey, why don't you try that? It's amazing. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. We're looking at verse 57, and, and I know the context is about death and the grave and everything, but what does sin produce in your life? Death. So let's talk about death, right? Verse 57, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where do we have victory? In who? In Him. And I know, we're t I know the context is death. Oh, death, where is I sting? Death is swallowed up in victory. But folks, if sin produces death and we have victory over death, why can't we say, look at it, look at it and go, hey, you know what? I, I know the guy's there. Believe, folks, I told you last week, I preached to me before, way before I ever teach to you. He's there. What can I look at? I can say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do who I am in Christ. Why? Because that's where the victory is, and that's where life is. Life isn't in this over here. That's death. How do I know that? Because the Word of God tells me that. And when the Word is what I'm building into my norms and standards and what my mind is looking at saying, you know what, I can go function that way, then when this guy raises his head up, this guy and this guy and this guy 
build that wall up and just say, no. We got victory. And that's what we're going to talk about next time. Is the war there? Yes. Does it rage? Oh, yeah. Only a fool would say that it doesn't. But you've been equipped in who you are in Christ to look at sin, to look at the things that are going on in life and say, no. You're not running the show. I'm going to live over here. Okay? All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for the look into Scripture, the clarity of it, and the desire to have that work and operate in our lives on a daily basis so that we can, so that we can have victory in our daily life here on earth so then we can then bring victory and honor and glory to you through our lives.